हरे राम हरे राम Anyway, within three months, then one day Kirtanana said, "We're going to go down, and we're going to you're going to take down for, and meet the Swami and be initiated." Prajumna, in the meantime, had come there, and Jodhrani was painting from morning till night, and um, Shivananda joined. Sam Greer was his name. He had a green Volkswagen bus, and so we. Of course, you know, imposed on that. Lend us the bus. We're going to go to, and, and he was very attached to his bus. It's a please, you know, you got to bring. It. Oh no, don't worry, don't worry. Of course, the bus blew up on the way back. But uh, so we drive to to uh, to New York in this bus. On the way down, we stop at my mother's place. She lives in near Brewster, New York, upstate New York, about an hour out of New York City. And we're all shaved up, dowdy, and the whole works. And I won't sit on a chair. I got to sit on the floor. Can't, you know? I got to cook. It. But my mother was happy because my mother is religiously inclined, spiritually inclined. She was quite happy. But it, it was pretty intense. Kirtananda, Prajumna, myself, Himavadi, and we're all in this new garb. Then we go on, and the when when we can when I came to Twenty Six Second Avenue. And Kirtananda took us upstairs to where Prabhupada had that little apartment. As soon as the door opened and I saw Prabhupada, he said, Oh, you've come. Like he, like we'd known each other always. And my immediate reaction was my, my entire muscular system just melted away. And I just sank down down to the ground, it just like felt like melting. I just bowed down, which is was taught to us by Kirtananda, that that's what you do. And my my muscles in my face began to twitch, and in my arms. And I finally got myself seated against the wall, and I was looking at Prabhupada, and he was just shining. And I thought, well, it's because I'm nervous, and my eye, you know, I'm just staring. So I started to blink my eyes. But it wasn't my eyes. Prabhupada was actually a golden effulgence. I mean, his, go his, 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 his complexion was golden, and there was actual effulgence streaming out from him. And he began to speak about how the karmis like all bitter things, and the devotees are having all these sweet things, and he went on and on like that. So that was my f very first encounter with, with Prabhupada. And the initiation, which I explained earlier in the temple, was kind of funny because uh, we, of course, knew that when you get initiated, you get another name. And my name, my Carmi name was Hans, H-A-N-S, and my last name was Carrie, K-A-R-Y. Of course, I had a middle name, which was also, and I never liked my name, because I was a, an immigrant. So you want to, you know, ever since childhood, I wanted to be part of the, be integrated into the social, social environment of, of my peers. So this name, Hans, and my middle name was Jürgen, and the last name is Carrie. So I was really anticipating getting a very exotic new name, like Hanuman or Hari Das or something. So but when it came time for me to receive my beads, uh, as I bowed down, and then Prabhupada said, your name is Hansaduda. And I didn't quite catch it. I said, um, what was that? He said, simply add Dutta. And I, and I got real disappointed. I thought, oh. So not only was the name still the same, it just had a suffix, Dutta, but my last name also remained the same because it got a prefix, Adi, Kari. So how's it Dutta das Adi Kari? I'm thinking, well, gee, I was really disappointed. And then after the initiation, when uh, everything had kind of cleared away, I thought, well, I should find out what my name means. I went to Prabhupada and asked him, well, uh, Swamiji, what does my name mean? Prabhupada said, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I was really bewildered. I went away, but it was nagging me that I really wanted to know what this name meant, so I came back again. I said, well, Prabhupada, is there some place where I can find it, where the meaning is, what the meaning of this name is? He said, yes. That's all he said. 
So again, I kind of wandered away, but I was determined. So a third time I approached Prabhupada. I said, well, where can I find, where, in which book can I find the meaning of this name? He said, in Srimad Bhagavatam. Of course, Srimad Bhagavatam, in those days, it was a big book, even though it was three, only three volumes as compared to this, so many we have today. <clears throat> anyway, so I let it go. But years later, when we were in Montreal, Prabhupada at one point was musing over different devotees' names. He said, oh, Shivananda means one who takes pleasure in, or Krishna Das means... And he was kind of going on like that, very casually. So I thought, oh, here's my opportunity. I said, well, Prabhupada, who is Hansa Duda? He said, you are. <laughs> For some reason, <laughs> Prabhupada simply <laughs> wasn't going to tell me straight away. What the, although I had read that the, 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 the name came from a book written by Rupa Goswami, but I wanted to hear it from Prabhupada, you see. So that was uh, one kind of curious inter incident. When we were at 26 Second Avenue, someone donated a green, uh, some hippies donated a green bus, a school bus. And I thought, wow, this is really great. So I approached Prabhupada that why don't we uh, test it out and take it to Boston? We'll make a trip to Boston. So he kind of agreed. Maybe I was really overbearing, I can't remember, but I was very enthusiastic. I thought this was really a great thing. So they rigged up a chair for Prabhupada right in the front, next to the driver almost. So when we got going, the, the thing was lurching because, you know, it was an old bus and the transmission wasn't quite in order. But the dash started to smoke too. So Prabhupada at one point he says, oh, it is like an Indian bus. And I thought, oh, this is a great compliment. Because we, we thought anything Indian must be good because Prabhupada's from India and that's where Krishna comes from. Then after some minutes he said, maybe better to sell it and get some money. I was wondering, why would we want to sell the bus? Anyway, we made it to Boston in the bus and of course later on, now that I look back on we understand what that was all about. We went to India with Prabhupada in 1970. That was the first time he took his American disciples. I was one of those. And one of the places we went to was Gujarat, which is recently in the news, and an indoor, indoor uh, no, Surat, in Gujarat, a very important city. And we stayed at the house of Bhagubai Jariwala. Jariwala means the people who make the gold threads. And um, that was a sensational, that was very sensational. It was, it was like, I mean, Prabhupada's coming to India was like the Beatles coming to America. It was just an absolutely sensational event or phenomena for Indians to see so many white people shaved up, singing and dancing, and talking Krishna consciousness, eating prasadam and sitting on the floor, and the whole thing was just like completely captured them. In fact, at one place we went, the mayor came, and they had shut the whole town down. Every business shut down. Everybody in town came to the train to greet Prabhupada. And he told us that even if Indira Gandhi came, she would not get this kind of reception. That's how sensational it was. Anyway, when we were staying with these people, um, Prabhupada would have darshan. And every morning he'd have a program early, which most people didn't attend, it's just devotees, but in the evening the local people came. So one evening, after the darshan, a man says, Yes, Swamiji, but Radha Krishna says, Rama Krishna says, that he was Krishna and that he was Rama. What do you think of that? And uh, knowing Prabhupada from his previous reactions and his vociferous attitude towards this kind of thing, I thought, oh, Prabhupada is just going to lay into this guy. But he didn't. What he did, Prabhupada said, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe he was. He said, but I know this is Krishna for sure, holding up the Bhagavad Gita. So why should I take a chance? So uh, when Prabhupada uh, had an exchange with someone, the same question could be asked ten times. He'd answer the same question different times. I heard people ask him, so you are... You are a pure devotee of Krishna? 
You'd say yes. So that means you see Krishna. Yes. So that means you can show me Krishna. This is a reporter. Prabhupada said yes. So the reporter said, so? Show me. He said yes. He just sat there. So he says, well, yes, first you become like them, pointing to his disciples with the shaved head. Then the reporter was like, whoa. But at other times, the same question, he would say, no, I'm not a, a pure devotee. Pandita Samadarshina, he said, no. I'm ordinary like you, I'm just like you. I don't know anything. All I know is what I heard from my guru. I'm just explaining that to you. They say, well, then why are we listening to you? He said, you, you don't have to listen. But I, all I can tell you is what I heard from my spiritual master. Otherwise, I'm ordinary, just like you. So Prabhupada could answer the same question in different ways. It, it depended on who he was talking to. But it was always complete. There, there, it was irrefutable. It was self-evident. And sometimes it was amusing. And sometimes it was so profound that just made your head spin. In the early days, he was giving a lecture at 26 Second Avenue, and it was full of hippies. He was sitting up, you know, maybe like up here, a little lower. Audience, and everyone, people right near to him. And one girl, very near to him, she kept raising her hand. And Prabhupada deliberately ignored her because he could understand that she was going to say something foolish. So he was trying to ignore her. But she was persistent, so finally Prabhupada recognized. He said, yes. Well, Swamiji, aren't there many ways to God? And Prabhupada said, no. There's only one way. Just like food. Food. You can't put it here or here. It must go here. And the whole place, you know, of course, burst into roaring laughter. One, one of the things that uh, really boggled my mind at that time, because I was the secretary, which meant that people who came to see Prabhupada, they would, they would invite him to their village or their place to come and, and, and do a program, and they wanted to host him. And Prabhupada always said, yes, see my secretary and he'll take the information and so they would come to see me, and uh, of course, within a day or two, the whole thing would be booked out. And I would uh, say, well, I'm sorry, but, you know, th it's not possible because we're, we already have something. They would go back to see the Swami and uh, complain. The secretary said, no. Prophet said, yes, I will come. Just make the uh, arrangement. So this went on for days. I I'm getting real, and you know, Indians are very persistent. That no, Swamiji, yes, said he's coming. I said, but uh, it's impossible. We were already scheduled to. Oh, and he, they'd go back. And so, anyway, after this went on for three, four, five days, finally I went to Prabhupada. I said, Prabhupada, everyone that asks you to come to their place, you say yes, and they see me to see me and to make an arrangement. And I say, I'm sorry, but we're already booked out. Uh, and they go back, and you say yes, and I say, I don't know what to do. I, I, we can't accommodate everyone. What do I do? Prabhupada said, it's my business to say yes. It's your business to say no. So how we finally settled it up was that uh, we, I, I would just say yes, okay, fine. i take all the information, but then when we got ready to go, we would evaluate all the, the prospects, and choose the one that had the most potential and send everyone else a telegram that we're, we can't come, sorry. So that concluded that. The other thing that took place or that, that uh, happened in Indo was <clears throat> Prabhupada had such a busy schedule because it was so successful. Because Gujarat, by, by they tend to be Krishna devotees. So, so many, there was such a great response to Prabhupada's presence that we would be up around the clock. Eleven o'clock, you know, you lie down. One o'clock, someone's, Prabhupada wants to see you. And during the day, all day long, you were having programs. So for days, in fact, for a couple of weeks, practically, 
I hadn't chanted a single round. And I was very, very uh, faithful to that, to, to miss around. I was like, whoa, mortal sin. And I hadn't read anything. So I went to Prabhupada. I said, Prabhupada, I haven't chanted any rounds. I haven't read any books. I just. He said, never mind. This is an emergency. You just do what I tell you. So that settled that. One engagement we went was with the king of Indore. And uh, and Prabhupada spoke there, and it was quite intimate because there was just the king and the queen and a f few of us. And Prabhupada told me earlier, before we started, that you tried to make him a life member. I said, okay. So when Prabhupada finished, then I began my, uh, my, pitch. my pitch, yeah, to convince the king that he should become a life member. But I, 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 I failed. So when everything was over and we were back in the car and on our way, I said, Prabhupada, I, I uh, you know, did I say the right thing? I mean, I, I, I wasn't able to convince him to be a member. He didn't become a member. Did I say the right thing about your books? He said, my books are like gold. One who knows the value will buy them. And, you know, so that's how he responded to that. But another curious thing happened there. A Prabhupada uh, asked me, this was not in, in Surat, it was in Indore. We were staying at a kind of ashram bhavan called uh, Gita Bhavan. And um, Prabhupada suggested one day, why don't you go and make some life members? And this was before I actually knew what a life member was. I said, what's a life member? He said, you go to some merchant or businessman and you show him our books, Krishna books, which he had printed on the way to India with Dainapan. And you uh, tell him what we're doing and you ask him to become a member and give 1,111 rupees and that he will receive subsequent publications and in this way supporting our movement. So I thought to myself, I thought, well, you know, these people don't speak English. What is, it, what is the use of approaching them? Why would they want to take our books? They can't read them. So I didn't say that, but that's what was going on in my mind. And therefore I just neglected to make an effort. Next day, Prabhupada again, he said, so why don't you, you know, go to the market and try to make some members? Uh, and I just said yes, but uh, the same thought was running through my mind, it didn't go. The next day Prabhupada said the same thing. I said, well, these people don't speak the language. He said, so you can take an interpreter? So I'd, by this time I understood Prabhupada really wanted me to do this. So I said, well, I should at least go through the motions, which I did. We went with this, this person that Prabhupada uh, suggested. We go to the first cloth merchant and I tell the man what to say and practically before he got finished the merchant whipped out his check and then wrote a check and you know so, well okay so we go to the next the same thing happens and then we go to a third party again the same thing happens so in in that short time we have three members I come back give to problem he said so now do you understand so that was my life mem initiation into life member making. In Vrindavan, this was some years later, of course, there was always a problem with uh, ladies, you know, a proliferation of ladies coming to the Vrindavan uh, guest house. And uh, at one point, Prabhupada almost daily was discussing this problem, what to do with these ladies, especially the ones who were, were without a husband but had children. So sometimes we, we considered sending them to Mayapur, sometimes sending them back to America, sometimes we thought, well, let them stay, or maybe... So it was an ongoing quandary. 
Then one day, in the in the course of one of these discussions, Prabhupada said, "On the one hand, we tell all our boys, don't marry, remain brahmachari. On the other hand, we tell all the ladies, you should marry. Every woman must have a husband." He said, "This is a contradiction in our philosophy." <laughs> he began to laugh. He said, "It's an insoluble problem. It can't be solved." <laughs> so, uh, also in 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 that Gita Bhavan, they would have a program daily and invite. They realized that Prabhupada was a great draw, like you know, like a, a famous celebrity coming. So you save him for the end to keep the crowd, and you put all the, the kind of second-rate acts first. But and this went on every day for a number of days and Prabhupada started to get aggravated about it because he could see that they were just using him. But at the same time they'd introduce these bogus sadhus who each one had a different kind of act, you know. So at one point Prabhupada just said, got, he said, no, well, we're going. Just in the middle of the whole thing, we had us all get up and walk off the stage. Another, on another occasion, the same uh, program, we were we were all, all on the stage, and of course Jamuna was there. I think Kasalya was with us. At least Himavati was with us. I can't remember Kasalya, but you know, Western ladies, and they were young in those days, nice looking, and and, and as a, well, it, it, it's just a sensational sight for for this, you know, th these people in this cultural setup. And at one one of these. Uh, programs, there was one man, he kept trying to reach up and touch their feet or touch their sari. And they kept, you know, receding, but he was very persistent. And at one point, he made himself so, so obnoxious that Prabhupada became angry. Prabhupada, we were all standing up and dancing at this point, and the kirtan was going on. And Prabhupada, you know, he was kind of observing this going on. And suddenly he became, he showed his, you know, his anger, he became very angry, he took his cartels and he, he, he ran towards that man and started, you know, trying to hit him with the cartels. So it, Prabhupada was just so beyond all the stereotyped and caricatured image of the sadhu and that was really nice to see that. In, in Surat also, we, in the morning Prabhupada would chant his rounds. There was like a, a, a concrete walkway outside our bungalows, back and forth, and the sun would be shining, would be kind of brisk. And I would walk with him. One morning, walking back and forth, chanting, he just stopped. And he pointed at the sun. He said, the yogis travel on sunbeams. And so, uh, he said, I know, because I have experimented in Hamburg. And then that's all he said, and that was it. In London, Himavati, she was a very good cook. So when Prabhupada came to London on one occasion with Shruti Kirti, Shruti Kirti told her, you know, you shouldn't cook very much because Prabhupada's not feeling well, he hasn't been eating much. She said, okay. Anyway, she goes and cooks an entire feast and brings it and leaves it with Prabhupada. She comes back and she sees practically everything is gone. She said, but Prabhupada, they said, you, you ate everything. They said, you were, you were not feeling well and you're not eating. He said, no, they just don't know how to cook. <laughs> in Mayapur, on a morning walk, and I'm, uh, you've probably seen this in the transcript, the prophet was talking about the coming war because in, in, there was a point, a time, where everyone was concerned about a war coming. And uh, in the course of that uh, walk, I asked Prabhupada, I said, Prabhupada, what should we do to prepare for the war? He said, chant Hare Krishna. I said, that's all? He said, prepare to chant Hare Krishna. In Montreal, which is where I was trained up by Kirtanananda, when Prabhupada finally came there, we had uh, 
pla where he was sitting, we placed the Jagannath deities next to him. And they were just small deities. But uh, Himavadi had made the outwards for them. And she was a very good seamstress. She was very um, talented in that way. So at one point, Prabhupada, he reached over and picked one up. And he started to examine the, uh, the sewing work on the dresses and the turbans. Very, I mean, very deliberately, just turning it, and then he asked, "Who, who did this?" And of course, someone said, "Oh, well, Himavadi." And he said to her, "He said, he said you can become self-realized just by sewing." So she replied, "Well, yes, Prabhupada, but I want a sewing machine, but Hansa Duda won't buy me one because it was three hundred dollars. She wanted the best one, and that was a lot of money." So he said, "Oh." No, you must have a sewing machine. You must have the best. So she was, of course, grinning from ear to ear. I said, yes, Prabhupada. And so that in, in Montreal also, of course, on Sunday when the feast was cooked, Prabhupada always received the first plate, right? And I was, I was very much into cooking because I was trained up as a cook in the Navy. And my family, my father, he was a chef, and my whole family, they were hotel, restaurant people. So when I came and joined, uh, Kirtanana was going to teach Himavati to cook. I said, no, you have to teach me to cook. If you don't teach me, I'm leaving. Of course, I, I wouldn't have left, but I, I just wanted to learn. And I, it was really a, uh, a very exciting thing for me to, to, to see and to learn the different techniques and the different preparations and so forth, spices. So, uh, um, this one occasion, it might have been a John Mastami, it was a big feast, and after Prabhupada, after the program was finished, we were walking from Prabhupada's Vyasa sign, which was quite a distance from the door, because it was a big bowling alley, and I was walking next to him, and, it, and Prabhupada stopped suddenly, and he turned to me, and said, your sweet balls are very good. And I got kind of like heady. He said, but mine were better. <laughs> In Bombay, this was also on our first trip to India, we were all crammed into Akash Ganga. And, and, as, and the devotees were sick, and toilets didn't work, and the water didn't come on. It was very hot and very uncomfortable. Anyway, so Himavadi, every now and then, she needed something. And of course, we had no money because we were just traveling with Prabhupada. So one day, I decided I got to ask Prabhupada what to do because I didn't know, how, you know, how to solve this problem. I said, Prabhupada, I'm, I'm a householder, but I'm traveling with you, preaching, and him, every now and then Himavadi needs something, but I don't have any money, and it's very embarrassing. Prabhupada said, Yes, a householder life is embarrassing. So I said, but what do I do? He said, what can be done? By hook or crook, get money. But Prabhupada didn't say, well, here's $20. And he said, yes, it is embarrassing. That's what it is. So once taking a train with Prabhupada, and there might have been three or four devotees with us, and uh, someone had given Prabhupada a pot of sweet balls. So just before the train took off, Prabhupada opened those sweet balls up and he uh, started to give them out. He took one and then he started. And so one devotee, he said, uh, Prabhupada, are those offered? He said, oh, you don't have to have any. <laughs> you don't have to have any. Another funny thing in connection with sweet balls that in the early days, Kirtananda was always trying to impose austerities on everyone. That was his, his mode at 26 Second Avenue. And every Sunday, of course, they cooked a lot of sweet balls and there'd be a lot left over. And the, the routine was that at breakfast time, you got those sweet balls with your cereal, which generally was farina. Drop them in the hot farina. It was really, really a uh, very, you know, delightful thing to have for breakfast. But Kirtanan insisted that we can't have more than two. So it became an issue at Istagosti, and we, we discuss it and haggle over it. 
but it couldn't be resolved. So finally, it came to Prabhupada's attention. Everybody assembled, and every and it was laid out before Prabhupada. So Prabhupada said, "Yes." So everyone can have as many sweet balls as they like, but Kirtananda can only have two. <laughs> so that was his sense of humor. I asked Prabhupada once, is it possible that a devotee, instead of having a relationship in Shantaras, Dasya, or, or, in, or rather a relationship where he goes back to Godhead and he has a relationship with Krishna, which we read about in our books, is it possible that a devotee might have a relationship where he doesn't go back to Godhead, but he just preaches? His relationship with Krishna is preaching. And before I could, just before I could finish, Prabhupada said, yes. He said, the Acharyas never go back to Godhead. He said, they remain in the material world, they travel from one planet to another, and they preach Krishna consciousness. So I said, well, does that mean, because the Acharya is a pure devotee, that although he's in the material world preaching, he's simultaneously in the spiritual world so it doesn't make any difference. Prabhupada said, yes, something like that. And another time he said, Hitler was a Shaktavish avatar. I said, a Shaktavish avatar? Yes, he said. He said, Shaktavish avatar means one who descends with special power, who is empowered to do something. It doesn't mean, Shaktavish avatar doesn't mean he always does good, but he may also do destructive things. Because I was German, so I, maybe that's why these things were triggered off, because sometimes he would say, uh, he told me that um, the Germans were very fond of Vedic culture. And in fact, that the Germans were the greatest Sanskrit scholars in the world, even greater than the Indians. And that the Germans had come to India and stolen certain uh, technical manuscripts, Vedic manuscripts, how to make rockets, and he said that's how they developed the U-2 rocket. In the early days when Prabhupada wanted to impress his audience about the importance of Bhagavad Gita, he would mention that uh, Emerson read Bhagavad Gita and Thoreau read Bhagavad Gita. And, and inevitably he'd mention even Hitler read Bhagavad Gita until someone told him, but Prabhupada, in this country, he's not very popular. Of course, Prabhupada pointed out, but in India, he's considered to be a hero because he was the enemy of the British. And so, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. In Bombay, after, in 1970, I think it was 1976, I brought a, a large party of devotees from Germany overland to India with big touring buses, a Mercedes touring bus and an MAN touring bus. But these touring buses turned out to be a real problem because in India you need what's called a carnet. It's like a visa for a person, but it's a visa for a vehicle. So I, I wound up really just always shuffling these vehicles around trying to keep them in the country and not getting really much accomplished. In the course of doing this, I lost touch with Prabhupada. Prabhupada didn't like it when you didn't communicate with him on a regular basis. He was supposed to send a report at least once a month and in some way keep touch more often than that. And in India it was even more important because India is so difficult. So I had been out of touch maybe for two months and finally caught up with Prabhupada in Bombay. So when I came in and I was making my obeisances, Prabhupada said, a rolling stone gathers no moss, which I thought is a compliment. He said, better sit down and gather some moss. Then I realized, oh, it's not a compliment. He said, where have you been? So I explained to him. He said, anyway, why not go to Sri Lanka and preach? I said, well, Prabhupada, you know, it's a small place. And you can go there for a week or two, but then, you know. He said, oh, everyone there is Krishna conscious? I said, no. He said, anyway, you can go to Pakistan, or you can go to Sri Lanka. I said, I'll go to Sri Lanka. <laughs> when I heard Pakistan, I said, no, I can't do that. Prabhupada had this, when we were traveling the first year in India, 1970-71, Oftentimes we'd go to very, very remote places. One time we went to a place, they were pulling us in a camel cart. And you know, a camel is quite tall. And the cart was quite low. And it was hooked up pretty close to the camel. So, 
So you can imagine how that was. And we were being paraded through the town doing Harinam. Or sometimes we'd walk, but it would just be, be a dusty, you know, a dusty hamlet with, in the middle of nowhere. But no matter where it was, Prabhupada would inevitably say, yes, this is a very nice place. And he would find, you know, some, some qualification which made it somehow or other a, a good place. It was centrally located, or the people are all very enthusiastic, or the food here is very nice. And then he would say, so, so uh, I, are you prepared to stay here and open the center? And I was thinking, no. <laughs> I said, yes, <laughs> terrified that he'd leave you there to open the center. Of course, that never happened to me, but <laughs> Prabhupada uh, came to Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden. And I, that was my zone in those days. I don't remember the year, but he lectured at Uppsala University. So after the lecture, one student raised his hand. He said, well, uh, Herman Hess says in his book, Siddhartha, so forth and so on. Prabhupada just let the guy wind out with his thing. When he was finished, Prabhupada said, who's Herman Hess? And you know, Herman Hess in those days was really in. You didn't know who Herman Hess was. You were nobody. The Prabhupada says, who's Herman Hess? And the student replies, you don't know who Herman Hess is? He's uh, the author of this, that. Prabhupada said, Herman Hess is not one of the Acharyas. Therefore, he has no importance. And that was the end of it. Just swept it away. In London, Prabhupada, we would already been told by Prabhupada how astrologers are all, you know, after money and women, and that astrology is a lost art. And he said his, his, his Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada, was a great astrologer, but he gave it up. He said, so don't bother with astrology. We are just dependent on Krishna. Anyway, one day Prajumna, who was Prabhupada's Sanskrit secretary and was very fond of all this kind of thing, he said, I'm going to go see B.K. Gandhi astrologer. Do you want to come? I said, well, I, yeah, okay, you know, against, I know Prabhupada didn't want me to go, I went. So when we got back, Prabhupada said, where have you been? And so I couldn't lie. I, well, I was with Prajumna. Prajumna, doing what? I said, well, he took me to see an astrologer. Astrology? I said, why? Well, Prajumna, you know, he said, astrologers are nonsense. Why did you go? We, I have instructed you not to go. I said, well, Prajumna asked me to go. He said, so if Prajumna asks you to jump off the bridge, you'll jump? Uh, no problem. So whenever, whenever we did something that wasn't sanctioned, it invariably came to light. W one time, a prophet had taught us, you, you can't lick the envelope. You have to use a little little water and do like that. That's suchi. And this is muchi. We were in Chandigarh. I was sitting on the bed. I had finished all the correspondence, sealed it up, but one, suddenly I discovered one letter remained that hadn't been sealed. And, but I'd already put everything away. So I immediately, you know, came to my mind, Prabhupada doesn't want us to lick the envelope, but it's just too troublesome to get that water again and do that. So I thought, well, yeah. But just as I'm going like this, Prabhupada opens the door and walks in. And he points his finger. <laughs> so that was Prabhupada. Um, in Germany, we, we, Prabhupada came to Germany in 19, I think it was 74. At any rate, during a morning walk with all the German devotees, who had only seen him that one time in their Krishna conscious life, <clears throat> walking through the fields, we had uh, this castle called Schloss Rettershof. Schloss means castle. Rettershof. It was a nice brownstone building. Prabhupada liked it very much. And it was situated on an old estate. Ritter, Ritter means the knights that went to war from the 11th century, 1150 or something. It was very old, very beautifully landscaped and sat on a kind of a hill that overlooked the valleys that just rolled into the distance. Picture perfect. Uh, and every day Prabhupada would take a walk through these fields. It was just beautiful. Anyway, one day 
while we were in this walk, he heard a helicopter go overhead. So Prabhupada looked up at the helicopter and the uh, devotee commented, Da, that's a helicopter. Prabhupada said, yes, I know. Sharm Sundar once, he took me by helicopter from Heathrow Airport. He said, so I know. He said, and then he, but he began to laugh. He, he, said, he said, but of course, I had to pay. But that was his, his service, he said, something to that effect. Anyway, then he began to tell a story to, to illustrate how, although Sharm Sunda took him by helicopter, and it was a very nice thing, very sensational way to, you know, bypass all the London traffic, that inevitably Prabhupada had to pay for that. So he tells a story about the, 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 the guru and his disciple. And the guru entrusts all his money and everything with the disciple, and this expert disciple makes all these nice programs and arrangements for him. So each place they go to, the arrangements are just first class. The food, the pot, everything is first class. And uh, each time, the, the, the guru is very pleased. He says, oh, this, I'm very pleased with you. This, you have done an excellent... And the disciple says, it's all your mercy. It's just all your mercy. So this goes on one after the other. When they finally complete their tour, the guru wants to, you know, he wants to access the money that he kept in trust with his disciple. And the disciple said, but I, I used it to arrange all those programs. He said, I told you, it was all your mercy. <laughs> and Prabhupada just burst into this, you know, enormous belly laugh. There's some pictures of it, you see. And um, it was really uh, delightful. The first time Prabhupada comes to Montreal, we, I had the opportunity to go in the car and, and drive back from the airport. And this was my first time to be in very close association with Prabhupada. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going to hear some very profound philosophical things. Uh, so as we're driving, Prabhupada, you know, it was kind of an older car, kind of a jalopy. It belonged to Janardhan, who, who was a student, so he didn't have much money. So Prabhupada um, noticed that, that the car was kind of beat up and old. So Prabhupada, and he asked what kind of car it was. Then he started to tell a story about a man who could tell any make of car just by hearing the sound. And uh, so his friends decided to test him. So they blindfolded him and one car after another, he said, oh, that's a Buick, that's a Chevy. So then uh, the friends, they took a donkey and they tied tin cans and scraps to the tail of the donkey and whipped it and ran it by the man. And the man said, oh, that's a Ford. <laughs> And Prabhupada just bursts into, you know, laughter. And I'm sitting in the back, I'm trying to figure out how this is spiritually profound. And I was so, I was so prejudiced towards hearing something uh, of a philosophical nature that I, could, I couldn't, I, I just could, I was completely bewildered. Like, what, what does this have to do with Krishna consciousness? <laughs> oh, that's a Ford. And Prabhupada just laughed. In Montreal, in the same bowling alley, Prabhupada had a... He's on the Vyasa Sand. So after one lecture and questions, one person raised their hand and said, Prabhupada, would you sign this book, your Bhagavatam? I said, Prabhupada, yes, sure. Came up and he signed it. Then another person raised their hand. Oh, Prabhupada, would you sign mine too? Okay. And suddenly a third person signed. Then when the fourth person raised his hand and asked if he could sign Prabhupada said, and now I will have to charge. Now I will have to charge. When the, uh, the, the astronauts went to the moon, we, we of course all know that Prabhupada was watching the TV and he had a servant, Purushottam. But uh, he kind of kept a running, uh, a running uh, track on uh, what was going on. He wanted, and uh, at that time I had come to L.A. I, I guess I was in Berkeley maybe. But I'd come to L.A. and Prabhupada, one day he asked me to write a letter to, to the editor of the New York Times about this moon landing, and he gave maybe ten points. He said, these are the points that you should uh, put in the letter, and uh, they should answer these points. And I don't remember them all, and I don't have the letter anymore. It's possible that it might be in the archives, but some of the points were that, first of all, why did the scientists internationally not recognize the moon landing? Because Scientists are generally above 
uh, national boundaries. They're, they're on a higher echelon. The other point was that the moon is 200 degrees below zero, so how could anything man-made function there? And the other one was the moon is a, made of shiny substance, possibly ice. And therefore, how could there be shadows? In this way, he gave a number of points. Of course, the letter was never published and there was no reply to it. But Prabhupada was very tuned into that. In Paris, Prabhupada went to Paris and Bhagavan was in Paris, Sham Sundar, Satru, myself. No, Satru, I don't think, was there. But at any rate, one morning, Bhagavan and Sham Sundar, don't, they, they didn't come from Mongol Arti. They weren't present. So when they finally appeared, sometime later in the day, during a darshan, Prabhupada said, where, where have you been? They explained, oh, we were out trying to, uh, we were out talking to some influential people to help us make programs for your preaching. Prabhupada said, oh, who are those influential people? So Bhagavan began to explain there was this lady, she was the owner of a nightclub. And uh, Prabhupada said, owner of a nightclub? So what did the nightclub, what did the nightclub owner suggest? Oh, they recommended another person. Oh, so the big man recommended another person. Then Prabhupada began to tell the story of the lion and the crane. He said, the lion got a bone stuck in his throat. So he approached the crane that, please remove the bone from my throat. You can stick your beak in there and pick it out. The crane said, no. If I put my head in your mouth, you will eat me. The lion said, no, I promise, I will not eat you. Not only that, I will give you a benediction if you do this. So the crane reluctantly stuck his head in the lion's mouth, removed the bone. Then the crane was standing in front of the lion, anticipating. The lion looked at him, what do you, why are you standing there, what do you want? So he said, you said that if I stuck my head in your mouth and removed the bone, that you would give me a benediction. The lion said, what? I allowed you to stick your head in my mouth and now you want a benediction? So Prabhupada's point was that the big men, they think if they just allow you to see them, that they have done you a great favor. So the moral is, he said, do your own work, don't depend on others. So, one day Prabhupada asked me, he said, why did I write all these books? I said, so that we can learn the philosophy. He said, no. He said, these books are there just to convince you to chant Hare Krishna. If you are convinced, there's no need to read these books. When, when Karanda left, then there was... It created a vacancy on the BBT trustee. At that time, Prabhupada was the trustee, Bali Mardan, and Karanda. There was just three. And uh, he was in London at the time. I think it was 73 or 74, I don't remember. But uh, one day, in the morning, he called me in. He was still sitting on his bed. He said... Uh, I want to um, appoint you as a BBT trustee. And I could understand right away that this was a very confidential service, more confidential than any other service because it had to do <coughs> with, uh, with the, the publication and distribu distribution of his books, which was a, actually separate completely from the, from the uh, from the institution, is kind of illegal. It was a legal separate thing. And that Prabhupada was personally part of that trust. So I was really astonished that he would ask me. I said, but Prabhupada, you have, uh, you have so many disciples. They, they have uh, MA, BA, some of them are PhD, they're educated. I'm, I, I haven't even finished high school. And in fact, uh, a few days earlier, he, he, uh, when I was bringing him the letters, he said, why is it that every letter you write, it has two or three spelling mistakes? So I kind of, I said, well, Prabhupada, I, I just didn't go to school. 
properly. I just couldn't. Oh, he's, he immediately, you know, you could see I was embarrassed. So he's, he said, oh, oh, yes. He said, you see, he picked up the little Oxford Dictionary. He said, I always carried the, this dictionary, little Oxford Dictionary, so you should get one. And when there's a word you don't know, you look it up. He said, that's how I learned English. And to this day, every time I have one every, everywhere I go, I, and whenever I see one, then I immediately think of Prabhupada. Of course, that was the effect Prabhupada had on us, that everything that he processed or referred to in the course of his preaching, either formally or casually, became a springboard for Krishna consciousness. I remember one day he pointed out dog stool. He said, highly infectious, this is your civilization. So now every time you see a dog or you see the dog stool, you think of Prabhupada. Now, you know, Prabhupada's engaging the stool to inspire us to be Krishna conscious. What, what, once he's passing by the, in the park, a man's doing the jumping jacks. Prabhupada stopped, he looked at him. He said, this exercise is for the body. He lifted his hand with the bead bag. He said, this exercise is for the soul. So when you see a man jumping jack, you think of Prabhupada. This was at least, this is the effect he had on me, and I imagine that the same effect for other people. Anything that was referred to by Prabhupada in the course of his preaching became permanently impressed on your heart, just like on the video, whatever is, is, is uh, impressed there. Whatever is taking place in front of the lens is impressed on the tape. So, um, anyway, getting back to the story, so I asked, but Prabhupada, you have so many disciples, PhD, they're all at <clears throat> and I remembered that a few days ago where he asked me, you know, why he can't spell right. And he stopped and he said, he said, because you, without being asked, have published and distributed my books. You have understood the importance of my books. Then he said, the devotees may fail, the temples may fail, but my books will live forever. So books, of course, we all know that. But Prabhupada also said it, and in that time, when he said the temples may fail, it didn't really... We couldn't imagine well, the devotees may fail, the temples may fail, how could they fail? Well, this, this is colossal, uh, dynamic, energetic environment where people were coming and money was flowing, books were being printed. It was, it was uh, unimaginable. But Prabhupada could have re already had a glimpse of that. So... Um, um, Books were very, very important to Prabhupada. The original Bhagavad Gita, of course, was printed by Macmillan. <clears throat> but um, the book didn't really sell. Actually, the, the, the rights were given to Macmillan, the rights for the book. In other words, the copyrights were actually given to Macmillan. But the clause was that if they failed to keep it in print, the rights would revert back to, to the BBT. Good thing. At that time, uh, I was in Germany, and we were in the process of translating the Bhagavad Gita into German. And I knew that I knew that the that we actually couldn't print it legally. But I was at the same time I was convinced that that Macmillan would not print that book again. So we just w went ahead and powered through and uh, had it translated and sent it to the printer even while the rights still belonged to Macmillan and we made a few few minor changes we made the book a little smaller and we printed the book on bible paper so when the book came out and I brought it to Prabhupada he looked at it and he said it's better than the American edition because it had the bible paper so I felt the, the beauty of being with Prabhupada was that you, he allowed you to innovate. He gave you the, the room or the, the confidence that you could do things without consulting him like a, you know, like a schoolboy has to consult his father. That, uh, and if you did something that was actually inspired by Krishna, which obviously it was, when, then Prabhupada would recognize that. And, and, and it was very enlivening and it, it gave you a cause for it to, to expand more. Uh, so, uh, very important part of relating to Prabhupada was that freedom that, that, uh, that he allowed his disciples 
to run with the ball. Of course, sometimes we fell on our face and lost the ball. <laughs> but, <laughs> but even that, Prabhupada would, would not make an ongoing uh, case of it and badger you every time you saw it. It was dealt with and that was it. And then you go on and continue. Once Prabhupada made a remark about uh, the Christians, he said, why, why do the Christians always show Jesus on the cross? And somebody said, well, you know, tried to give some explanation. Of course, it was insufficient. Prabhupada said, but if you love Jesus, if you love him, why do you picture him in, in his most humiliating and gruesome circumstance? If you love someone, would you put their picture on your mantle in, you know, in his most embarrassing and gruesome? And, and when he said that, it just, a whole, it was a, a world open, so something so obvious and so really bizarre and perverse, but we never see it. But when Prabhupada commented on it suddenly, it, it took on a whole other perspective. And Prabhupada was doing that, he, he had a way of doing that again and again and again, in so many ways. At a GBC meeting, the habit of the GBC as the years rolled on was to become more and more um, um, absorbed in, in secondary and managerial issues. And they would go on for hours and days discussing and then writing up uh, resolutions, papers of resolutions. So on this one occasion, they bring all these re after, where they bring the resolutions to Prabhupada for approval. Prabhupada looks at them and he flips through them casually. He says, but, but have you discussed how to improve the quality of chanting Hare Krishna? And we're thinking, but, you know, <laughs> you know, what is like, that's not important. <laughs> so Prabhupada said at that time, he said that the GBC meeting should take two hours, three, four at most. Of course, we're taking days upon days. Prabhupada was really concerned with the quality of our spiritual life, especially on the basis of chanting, because, in fact, Prabhupada once told me, he said, if a person does not chant Hare Krishna, then his devotional service becomes karma. In other words, his activities become karmic, because what's the difference between what we do and what they do? The difference is that it's treated or it's purified by the vibration which keeps us in touch. In, in India, sometimes Prabhupada, <clears throat> uh, he would, when we're in a, a taxi or a car and stop somewhere, especially in places like Calcutta, and the beggars would come to the door, he would, if he didn't have, he would ask us, you give them, give them something. At a, when we, we were hosted by some family, <clears throat> families all have servants, and when we were ready to go, Prabhupada would sit somewhere, and then he asked the proprietor to bring all the servants, and then in order of seniority, he would give them all some rupees. Those that were more senior got more, and those that were less, they got less. So Prabhupada was very very uh, concerned all around. It wasn't, he wasn't just up there and he couldn't relate or interact. Once uh, I got a phone call, I was in Germany and I said, you got to come to Zurich right away. I said, why? What's going on? Prabhupada wants you to come right away. We don't know. He just wants you, Bhagavan, and whatever, to come. All right, so we go. And even when I arrived, still nobody knows. Or no one's telling me. In the middle of the night, maybe midnight, one o'clock, someone comes. Prabhupada wants to see 
you and you and everyone. Okay, we come in. And Prabhupada is like angry. How could you? He's talking to Bhagavan and Bali Mardan. What happened is that they had Sham Sundar, but, but no, he's talking to Sham Sundar and and Bali Mardan. They had taken all the money, BBT money and whatever money they could get their hands on, and bought gold because that was the year that Nixon deregulated the dollar, deregulated the dollar, took it off the gold standard, and Sham Sundar, wizard that he was, knew that it was going to really skyrocket, which it did. So Prabhupada was angry. How could you? How could you do that? You're gambling. And Shamsinda kept saying, but Prabhupada, we made money, it went up. But Prabhupada said, but it's our principle, it's gambling, you cannot break our principle. And he kept saying, but we made money, you know, we're making, so... But Prabhupada said, no, we cannot break our principle. Our principle is no gambling and investing money in gold is gambling. So the next day, he marched into the bank and just, he sold all that gold off, finished. He just wouldn't budge from that principle. Shama Shinder marched into the bank? No, Prabhupada, Prabhupada with Sham Sinder, and that converted it all back into, into dollars. On the way down, I remember we were driving in a car and Sham Sinder apparently knew his way around. And Prabhupada noticed that because Sham Sinder was pointing out different things. And so, the Prabhupada remarked that, oh, you, you know your way around. And Sham Sundar went off. He said, oh, yes, when I was, whatever, 17, I left home and I went here and I went there and I traveled all over the world. And he was kind of giving a little resume of his adventures. Then when he had wound out, then there was a kind of silence. Then Prabhupada said, uh, I left home when I was 50. <laughs> and the way he said it was just <laughs> uh, kind of put everything back in perspective. In in the same same vein, he was walking the Oxford Street, taking a walk, and then uh, he stopped. He said, "You see, Krishna fulfills all desires." He said, "When I was a little boy, I always wanted to come to London, and now I'm in London. So Krishna fulfills all desires. It just may take a little time." He said. In Hawaii, at one point, someone had given, donated a restaurant, and Sudama was in charge in that area. But somehow or other, Sudama felt that the restaurant belonged to him. He wanted to claim it as his. So there was a, a meeting about that incident. And so Prabhupada said, so uh, you are my disciple. Sudama said, yes. So whatever is given to you is meant for me. Sudama said yes. So the restaurant, who does the restaurant belong to? Does it belong to you or does it belong to me? Sudama said, belongs to me. So Prabhupada said, okay, take it and be happy. And he left the room. And when he left the room, then Prabhupada said, so what should we do? Should we prosecute? And Guru Kripa, who was there, said, yeah. So, so Prabhupada kind of pondered on it. He said, no. He said, then we become just like ordinary karmis. He said, our life is based on love and trust. And if we're not going to live that way, then we won't have a spiritual life. So he just let it, let it go. Another thing about Prabhupada was that um, He, he would not, he would not uh, conspire. When someone came to complain, he said, he called that person, said, okay, now what did you say? He wouldn't allow himself to be drawn into a conspiracy. He used to say, you can, no, psh, psh, psh. he called it fish, fish, psh, 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 psh. said, you go to a meeting and you speak out plainly, you can fat, fight like cats and dogs at the meeting, but at the end, whatever you agree to, that you have to carry that out. He wouldn't, and and normally as a cel a celebrity, 
a prominent person in the society, whether he's a politician or an entertainer, they have two lives, one that they show to the public and another life that is completely contrary. Prabhupada wasn't like that. He had only one life. He was, and, and the thing that impressed me again and again every time I met him, that Prabhupada was exactly like his books. When you read the book and when you were in the presence of Prabhupada and he spoke and you had some exchange, it was exactly like the book. There was no difference. But a any other person, there's always this, this other side. And that was so disarming. As soon as you came in, you with a host of you know, your head full of problems. As soon as you came in, they evaporated. So everything is all right. Oh yes, probably. Yeah. As soon as you walk out the door, you're puzzled again. Like, oh. <laughs> and then puzzled. In London, have you been in the London Manor Temple? The Manor, you know, that big room, probably. So he's sitting at that end against those leaded windows, and he had that table. <clears throat> One day I come in, and Himavati is sitting behind the table with Prabhupada on the cushion. And she has his hand in her hand, and she's reading, she's doing palm reading on Prabhupada. Prabhupada saying, well, what about this line? What does this mean? Oh, Prabhupada, that's your, that's your headline. Oh, you have a very good headline. And they go, <laughs> and they're going on like that very casually, as if they were thick and thin friends. So Himavati was related to Prabhupada, completely different than I was. He was very affectionate to her, very friendly. And it wasn't an, an artificial or imposition. She was naturally at home with him, whereas I was, you know, awe and reverence. Awe and reverence. Krishna. With every person, even when Chaim Sunda, I explained earlier, he brought this host of celebrities, I noticed that with each person Prabhupada greeted him differently. Like with Lord Brockway, who was a government official and a respectable, some supposed respectable gentleman. Prabhupada personally went to the door and opened it up when he came to, and walked him, sat him down. But with others, but he didn't do that with everyone. So with everyone he related just exactly. And Prabhupada could be very cutting also. He was very gentle and smiling and soft and sometimes patronizing. No. And there were times when, while he was giving darshan, he said, well, what about Jesus? And Prabhupada would just say, you follow Jesus? You follow Buddha? Or you just talk? Oh, you just talk. Don't talk. He, he could be very... I met a man in uh, Palo Alto some years ago, I was looking for a storefront in the better section of town. He had an art gallery. So as I was kind of browsing around, he, he said, Oh, you're a follower of Swami Prabhupada? I said, yeah, Yes, how do you know? He said, Oh, I see your beads. He said, I met Swami Prabhupada at Palo Alto University in 19, I think he was there in 67 or 66. I said, Really? Tell me about it. He said, oh yes, I met, he was the most, uh, he was the most unforgettable man I ever met. I said, how is that? What did, did you discuss? He said, yes, after the lecture, then we discussed. And I said, I was complaining about the government. And Prabhupada said, no, you cannot complain. You elected, you elected, you cannot ex ex complain. And the man said, but I kept saying, but I didn't elect him. The prophet said, no, you elected him. That is your system. You cannot complain. And he said, he simply wouldn't allow me to get off this point. <laughs> you elected, therefore you are responsible. The thing that, imp that made it possible for a person like me to have the association that I had with Prabhupada and to perform the service that I performed <clears throat> was the fact that um, Prabhupada responded to enthusiasm. He did not respond to material qualifications like scholarship or even expertise in a particular field. 
enthusiasm was the one factor that that eclipsed everything else. If that enthusiasm was alive, if that enthusiasm was genuine, then uh, there was no limit. In fact, I mean, in my own case, I, I was not educated, right? And not experienced professionally in any way. And even now, I'm not an American. I was actually born in Germany. So, I, and I was also married. But Prabhupada gave me so many uh, opportunities, so many responsible engagements. Whereas other persons under material circumstances would have been given such responsibilities. And we saw that uh, not only in myself, I saw it in the case of Guru Kripa. Uh, so many. Madhavisa. Anyone who had enthusiasm and determination, uh, they, they were, I mean, Prabhupada looked to them to carry the ball. And of course, we see that even in material life, right? And, but Prabhupada, but the enthusiasm alone, it wasn't left, uh, you know, in its raw state. Prabhupada trained it or focused it and purified it. So the things that we did for Prabhupada were done under his guidance. He would simply say, do this. Like I remember, he wrote me like, why are my books not being printed in Germany? And I'm thinking, well, I, I can hardly speak German at the 10-year-old ten, ten level. How, you know, I, don't, I can't translate them. And um, then I, I, I mean, then I understood, oh, Prabhupada wants his books translated into German. So I had to figure out how to do that. And so I wrote him, well, well, what do I do? He said, you chant Hare Krishna and Krishna will give you intelligence. That was almost always the answer I got. Prabhupada wasn't the type of uh, manager or leader who would lay it, detail it out for you. He, he would inspire you to use your creative intelligence. In fact, Prabhupada said that every living entity every, has individual genius. There's a kind of genius that everyone has. When I looked up the word genius in the dictionary, it means indwelling deity. Genius is not something I or you or anyone possesses. Genius really means Krishna. So if we make ourselves receptive to Krishna, the inflow of Krishna, by the inspiration of the spiritual master, then that genius or Krishna reveals how a thing should be done. Like in the case of Brahmananda tells a story how Prabhupada asked him to go to Macmillan and give him the manuscript, and he was hesitant, like, you know, well, you know Macmillan's a big company, come on. So, but when we submitted to his direction, combined with the chanting and the philosophy and the entire process or the treatment, as Prabhupada sometimes called it, then awesome things happened. Or as Prabhupada said, the pure devotee doesn't do anything extraordinary, but extraordinary things take place all around him. Like Sham Sundar's connecting with George Harrison. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing. The whole world is, 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 is sitting or waiting at his door, but by the genius of and the, and the inspiration, enthusiasm of Sham Sundar, Krishna opened the door for him. So that, that and Prabhupada also, one thing that always struck me about Prabhupada, that, that there's no harm in trying, because you can, and the case in point is in, in Montreal, there was a big building right across from McGill University. And at that time we had no money, we could hardly pay the rent. And Prabhupada saw this building and he liked this building. He told Janardin, inquire about this building, what do they want for it? And Janardin said, well, you know, that's got to be more than a million dollars. He said, just inquire. Tell them we have $10,000 and we'll pay them $1,000 a month. And Janardin, of course, that's an absurd proposal, or, you know, business, from a business point of view. And, he, and at the same time, he asked me, he noticed that the downstairs had kind of a, a store 
facility where you could have a shop or a restaurant. So he asked me whether I would be capable and willing to run a restaurant and whether I could generate a thousand dollars a month profit. I said, well, I, I guess I could. And so Prabhupada urged Janardhan to find out, to contact the government, was a government building, and make this offer. But Janardhan was reluctant because it just didn't seem realistic. Uh, we never did get the building, but that was, that was how Prabhupada saw that Krishna can do anything. So, uh, in fact, he, because I often used to be worried about money, he used to tell me, he said, don't worry about money. Try to do something wonderful for Krishna and money will come. And that, that really was the basis of, of his, that, that was his policy, that was his, uh, his theme, the basis of his operation. I mean, after all, Prabhupada came to America with nothing. And he had some idea of preaching to intelligent class of men, but he actually by default wound up on the Bowery with the least intelligent class of men and the most degraded class of men. But they're the ones that carried the ball. They are the ones that carried the ball. Well, I hear so many devotees say now that, oh, I didn't get the chance to associate with Prabhupada. But the fact is that Prabhupada was accessible to everyone. But that access was conditional. That you had to be prepared to accept any direction, anytime, anywhere, without reservation. If that wasn't there, you couldn't really come too close to Prabhupada. You had to keep a distance. At least that's my experience. It's not that people were kept away. It's, I, want, I know that in, in my case, I personally wanted... In fact, the first incident when I was in Montreal, uh, at one Sunday feast, I made a collection after the feast. I, I thought, oh, this is a... Now I have something to write Prabhupada about. And I did, and I got a letter back. And from that time on, I decided I must always do something that warrants right, writing or reporting so that I will get a response. I needed that. In fact, in Germany, things were so bleak in that country. It's a ter I mean, I'm born in Germany, but I still think it's an awful environment. And German people are extremely unfortunate and hard-hearted. But the way, the, the thing that kept me going was that every two weeks, I would receive a letter. It'd take one week to reach Prabhupada, one week to reach me. So when, by the time one week went by, right, I was already, go my battery was going down. And then it was into day eight, day nine, ten, and by, t by eleven and twelve, if, if I would be walking down to meet the mailman a few blocks to see if that letter was there. If it wasn't there, I just went back and went to sleep. I, I couldn't function. And when the letter came, then again there was... So Prabhupada's connection, right, his connection, and his sanction, and, and that, that was the whole thing. Material qualifications had nothing to do with it at all. I spoke, I remember, I, I had the opportunity to speak at Harvard University. In fact, before that, uh, when we opened Berkeley in 1969 with Narayan, we had the opportunity to give a class there, yoga class, we made some devotees. But a later time, there was a, a program where I was actually giving a lecture at Harvard University to the faculty. And I was thinking to myself all the time, I said, this is, this, is, this is Krishna consciousness. Here I am, a high school dropout. I'm giving a lecture to the faculty of Harvard University, and they have no idea. And so I actually, after, the, after I finished, I, I, I actually said that. I said, you see, this is the power of the pure devotee. That by his mercy, a person who has no qualification can actually uh, be in that, in, in that orbit where normally it is not, it's not possible.